Okay, okay. All right, so uh, welcome. Uh, assalamualaikum. Good morning uh, to uh, all uh, uh, who are here uh, to uh, learn and to uh, sort of strategize um, uh, your teaching and uh, learning research. And uh, we are happy to hear uh, to have uh, here with us um, a dear friend of mine, uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Dorothy. Uh, Associate Professor Dr. Dorothy Dewitt uh, from Faculty of Education um, and today, uh, this morning uh, from 10 to 1 o'clock, we are going to uh, look at uh, how um, we can, um, with the help of uh, Dr. Dorothy, um, look at the research and scholarship uh, in teaching and learning. So uh, normally what we call it soft isn't it, uh, in, in education. Uh, and how we can um, strategize uh, and uh, do research with uh, our students. So uh, the, the learning outcomes for today's session uh, is uh, number one, to design the teaching and learning research in the setting of PNL research. Uh, and uh, I believe that Dr. Dorothy is going to show us uh, several methodologies uh, to achieve that and also uh, to determine a suitable method uh, to uh, doing um, uh, the TNL research. So a bit of um, information or background on Dr. Dorothy. Um, she is an associate professor uh, and uh, her department is Curriculum and Instructional Technology uh, from the Faculty of Education. She also is a recipient of the Endeavour Executive Fellowship from the government of uh, Australia. Um, of course, we all know her uh, as somebody who's been doing uh, uh, training with EDEC quite a lot. And also she, she has been doing uh, research in instructional design, uh, in new pedagogies and, and also technologies for knowledge management, collaborative uh, mobile learning and also problem solving. She has uh, consulted uh, many projects uh, relating to curriculum uh, acceptance and also 21st century learning. She has also won awards uh, for teaching innovations and the most uh, recent one was Best Immersive Learning Showcase at uh, Island 2020. So this is an international, international um, award. Uh, so I think um, without uh, further ado, um, uh, let's have uh, Dr. Dorothy to uh, uh, train us and start her session. Uh, over to you, Dr. Dorothy. Thank you very much, Dr. Zahir. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Uh, so I recognize some of your names. I mean, I recognize, I know you, some of you. Okay, and I'm very honored to have some professors also among us. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for um, coming. And uh, I'll try and share what, whatever I, my experience as well as um, my knowledge on research methodologies in education. And uh, within these three hours, wow, so long three hours, okay, I hope it will be an interactive session so that you can ask me questions. You can stop me at any time. If I don't see you putting up your hand, then uh, maybe you can, you know, just shout out and say hi or ask me your question. All right, is that okay? Okay, I'm assuming it's okay. Thank you. Yeah, I can see you now because <laughs> when I share screen, I might not be able to see you. Okay, so I will be going into a theory first, um, why we need this scholarship of teaching and learning and a little bit of the methodologies um, that we can use for teaching and learning research. And, and then um, maybe we'll look at some research and you can also ask me about research that you are doing and how we can go forward from, from there, <laughs> okay? I don't uh, guarantee I will have all the answers because it is a, a tough journey getting published. Um, and especially if you're aiming for the high level papers, the ISI papers, okay? But we, we try and... Um, well, it's something we'll have to learn from failure. One of the innovative pedagogies, 2016, innovative, uh, sorry, what? Productive failure. So 
we have to make mistakes and we learn from our mistakes. Okay, and that's what we tell our students. Huh? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I, I will start uh, sharing my screen. Just a minute. Huh? So I've got a set of slides prepared and also I'll be asking you uh, some questions in a while. Okay. All right, you're seeing my slides, strategizing your teaching. And so we try, we are trying to strategize how we can do it better. Um, so we'll also try and see whether what research method works with your, with your content area. Okay, now I'll um, be covering these areas, the rationale, and there are some research designs, okay, and examples of research. Can I ask you some questions? So I would like you to please um, scan the QR code, okay, and I will activate a few questions there. I'm using Slido, okay. If you are unable to scan the QR code, I think Sharifa will put the link on the chat. Yes, and I put it there. Thank you. And I'm going to go to Slido and activate the first poll. So if you are seeing, if you are at that link, I hope you are seeing um, this question. Oh, I do research in teaching and learning. So I have... Uh, some saying to a large extent, sometimes, hardly, never. So we have here some who have never done any research on teaching and learning. Some who have sometimes done. And uh, there are some who have been doing a lot of teaching and learning research hmm? to a large extent. So there are some people. Wow. Okay. So we have a wide variety. So I guess the largest respondents belong to the group sometimes. Okay. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to go on to the next question you see on your device that you have uh, locked on in. Are you familiar with research, educational research methods? How familiar are you? Okay, the majority seems to be in the not familiar. Oh, but somewhat familiar is coming up. <laughs> Uh, so majority are not familiar, but there's 5% here who have or are very, very familiar with research, educational research methods. Wow. Okay. All right. So for those who are not familiar, I'll be touching <clears throat> some of the research methods, but those are not all Okay, there are many, many, many research methods available and, of course, a lot of uh, variety. Okay, so the next question I'm asking is your opinion. Why do you think you need research for teaching or why do you specifically need research for teaching? Can you type in? <laughs> oh, wow, evidence-based teaching. Improvement of good deliverance. Oh. Improvement. Improve your skills. Fantastic. So we have a very good uh, team of lecturers who are very, very conscientious. They want to improve themselves. Congratulations. Uh, so all of you here are those who are very motivated to improve yourself, solve problems in class. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay. 
um, I'm, I'm sure your students um, actually experiencing the best from you already. You're already experimenting, uh, trying to gauge your teaching, improve your well, supervision too, okay, and trying to get the best methods, make it interactive and fun. Uh, see so many beautiful replies showing me that you're all very motivated. UM is uh, very uh, lucky to have you. Okay, any more? Five seconds. I'm going to move on to the next question. Do I have a next question? Can I remember? Five, four, three, two, one. And uh, okay, what is most important to you when you are doing educational research? I think this is the last question. What is most important to you? when you are doing educational research? Is it getting the theory, getting a grant? <laughs> Most important. Wow, so the highest seem to be the research method. Huh? Even though getting, getting grant is important, it will help a lot actually if we have money to do things. A lot of, uh, even my teaching, I feel that I'm limited because I don't have money to, to get certain devices and so on. Uh, but for, for you, for most of you here, research methods is important, followed by participants who are supportive. That means your students. I understand, I think undergraduates, it's quite difficult to, um, you know, depend on them. Uh, sometimes they, they feel that they, they need to be given the best or they don't need, very difficult to catch them to do your to do what you want them to do, right? <laughs> and uh, getting a collaborator for, for some of us, it helps actually if um, you have someone from education because I think when it comes to the theories, the person from education may have more idea of the theory. See, nobody chose theory. Wow. <laughs> and, and even uh, team members who are supportive, nobody chose. So that is not important to you, right? But actually, uh, theory and um, uh, it, it's an important area when you want to get published in a very, very good journal. Hmm? Okay, so, okay, getting grant money is important. Huh? Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. So, I'm going to go back to my slides. So, uh, as I shared with you, I'll be doing um, some of the things like research methodologies. Huh? So, before I go into what research methodologies are available in teaching and learning, let's look at why is it important to do research. But all of you have put, um, you know, self, uh, your self-interest, actually wanting to know how to improve yourself, your skills. Okay, but nobody put KPI. Eh? Hmm. <laughs> Key performance indicator. We should, we have actually the teaching, uh, the research and scholarship, okay, our teaching, our research and scholarship, and our service in the KPI. So uh, do you think there is a position for research in teaching? Is there um, scholarship for teaching in our, in our teaching practice? Ladies and gentlemen, anybody who wants to answer that? Is there a position for research? in our KPI. Yes, I think. Yes. Is, uh, yeah. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, <laughs> not sure, right? I think, I, think, I think there is. Uh... Not very sure. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm confused, sorry. <laughs> I, uh, from the lack of answers, so is probably many of us are also thinking: Is there really a KPI for teaching and learning? 
maybe it is not directly, maybe we can put it under scholarship and, and it would be fantastic if we get published and if we win awards. So that's where we can probably get our KPI for our teaching and learning research. So there is, so we are, we are all very sure there is a scholarship in our research area from whichever field you're for you're from. But we are not sure whether this scholarship of teaching and learning is relevant or not. Uh, in, um, in the literature, there, there's uh, two, two things that we will hear. Uh, we'll, we'll hear teaching, of course. There is scholarly teaching, which uh, most of you have uh, put from the reasons that you have given. I see that most of you are or intend to do scholarly teaching so that you can improve your current practices, okay? And improve your skills, get your, your students to have fun and interact with you. However, there is a field called Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. Uh, so it's a bit smaller, okay? But it is when we use the data, the findings that we have and make it publicly available, that means publish, maybe have a peer, in a peer-reviewed journal and disseminate to the professional community. So that is what uh, Schumann says, is a scholarship of teaching and learning. So once we, 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 we can just do teaching and learning research, all right, uh, just to improve ourselves and have fun with the students and see whether it works. But we should actually aim for it to be published. Why waste your time, right? So we try and make it more, um, what shall I say, uh, uh, professional, more of a scholarship in nature by trying to use better met research methodologies. So this is where I hope that you will, you will be able to publish your research at least in a... Scopus rank journal because um, we tend to be in the humanities when we are doing uh, teaching and learning research because we are dealing with students. So most of they're more uh, what do you call uh, journals that are in the Scopus rank publication rather than in the ISI. But there are there are some ISI ranked journals, of course which publish on teaching and learning. You can, if your research is very good in theory, you can probably aim for these journals. Okay, so we want to actually aim for teaching to update our expertise, right? And we'll try for SOTEL, okay? Scholarship of Teaching and Learning, which is separate from the scholarship. Yeah, I understand, separate from the scholarship in your area. Okay, because your primary research area might be business, might be pharmacy, might be medicine. Okay, but this is scholarship in your area of work as well. All right. Is there anything that prevents you from doing scholarship of teaching and learning? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, can I uh, ask you to share? Should I? Sh uh, um, I, I won't stop sharing the screen, I think. Can you tell me or um, can you write in the chat and tell me if there's any reason that you do not or cannot do a scholarship of teaching and learning? What's your reason? Not familiar, okay. <laughs> not familiar with the research methodology, yeah? So I can help you there. I can uh, expose you to a few research methodology. So it's something new for Shelley. Okay. Don't have the knowledge. Mm. The knowledge meaning the theory or the research methodology, time and money, yeah, time and... Um, I understand. I think most of us lecturers, uh, theory and method, uh, most of us lecturers, we have, so much to do, so much KPIs that we need to do, okay, and uh, okay, it's, it's quite difficult. No idea on how to start, huh? all right, okay. Uh, so today, maybe we will be able to discuss, <laughs> okay, theory, yeah, fun, huh? 
Okay, we'll try and discuss ways uh, that you can you can try out your scholarship of teaching and learning. So you are not alone in having all these problems. I have um, referenced some literature when I, when I did these slides or so, and I know it's difficult. Even I myself also you know, do uh, research. Uh, okay, it's quite difficult because low yield. It is not... When you publish in a Scopus rank journal, sometimes you find that yeah, this is not worth it. I can do my in my research in my discipline and get an even better, higher ranking journal. And then there's even less citations because people not so interested in this scholarship of teaching and learning currently. Okay, so publication also you have to look for relevant journals require time, effort, grants, lacking. Okay, so this, this were among the barriers that uh, lecturers face. And, and however, okay, I'd also like to uh, point out that there are some benefits. So you have already, I think most of you are very interested in the benefits, looking at how to improve your teaching and, and uh, learning. Okay, and then uh, you'll be able to get more ideas and even think more, generate more research questions on how students learn. So you'll be able to understand your students better. And um, once we share it with other scholars, we also get uh, some recognition. University also gets rec recognition. So that's why actually the university encourages uh, scholarship of teaching and learning because there is more uh, to gain when their lecturers are doing research. So when students get to know that, oh, in this university, the lecturers are trying out new, exciting things, they will also come. And when you win, when you as lecturers win awards and excellence, the university's ranking goes up and uh, the university gets more renowned. So for a university, for the institution, it is very, very important for you to do SOTEL, okay? So you're actually in line with the hasrat now of the university, okay? Anybody wants to share anything? No, nope. okay, as someone said, in this YouTube video, which I won't play because I don't think we have time, but if we do have time, we can have a look at it. Those who participate in SOTEL are the assets to their institutions. Okay, I think it was Bernstein who said this, and this is Bernstein, because they will generate visible analysis of students' learning taking place. So you make it uh, concrete, okay? You have excellent models of practice, Evidence-based, okay, you're talking. So there's high quality evidence, all right, of what you are doing that is right, that is correct, or that needs to be improved is okay, right? But at least you're doing work in this, this direction. So it's actually very beneficial for the institution. And um, there are researchers who say that currently the faculty, your lecturers, uh, your team of lecturers may be actually competing a among each other for performance. But when you use a SOTEL model, it becomes a more collaborative effort. Everyone has a different point of view. It's democratic, it's dialogic. You try to you know, give ideas and it's focused on the process rather than the product, collaborative. And so it tends to be more friendly and cooperative. So we actually encourage the faculty to work together if we focus on the SOTEL uh, approach. Hmm? And what do you play? What kind of role you play? How do you play? What do you play? Do we just lecture and tutor our students, right? So when you focus on the SOTEL approach, you are actually focusing on the pedagogy. What you have to think back of what is the best pedagogy? What maybe innovative pedagogies to encourage and to engage with your students, okay? And you reflect on it and have it publicly reviewed when you publish it, and that gives it more confidence, 
Okay, so this is what Schumann said. All right, anybody wants to share anything? No? If not, we are going to go, we're going to move into the methodology soon, but I'm going to tell you that what we are doing in Sotel is actually interdisciplinary work because it may involve the humanities students who are human beings, okay, who have different psychological, different readiness, okay, different, they're all very different, different learning styles, okay, so there's a lot of differences among the students. And you may be using methods of social sciences, uh, such as what I'll be showing you, okay, quantitative and qualitative and even mixed method. And you might be, a, if you are in the sciences, you might also be um, using the sciences involved. And if you look at uh, instructional design and instructional technology, it is also a scientific based, systematic research based on models and on models of teaching. So you could be, you would be combining actually different areas in your methodology. So SOTEL is actually interdisciplinary research and it could be in your field of practice. So you have, you have seen that it could be informal, like scholarly teaching, it could be formal and could be published in even a high ranking journal like in the web of science. And um, so it's from scholarly to scholarship, from interdisciplinary, and sometimes it also focuses on discipline-specific knowledge, even though it's interdisciplinary, because how do you teach business students, for example, science students, math students, okay? And it's educational research. So we're looking for evidence in our methods. What evidences do we use? Okay, and we try to integrate discipline-specific theories with educational theories. So that is the difficulty, okay? Interdisciplinary research. So we're going into research designs now, okay? Any questions so far? Ah, what's the difference uh, between interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary? When it is multidisciplinary, the research is independently. Okay, so research in, let's say, for example, medicine and uh, education and communication separately. So if you're on a multidisciplinary team, the team of lecturers doing research in medicine, you just do your research. Okay, and in education, I'll do my research. We're doing on this topic, but we're doing it in this area. And um, uh, the other team was at communications, for example, they're doing in their area separately. Whereas interdisciplinary, we combine and uh, we try and merge. So we're going to get new theories actually from medicine and education and communication, all three combining. And that's where it becomes more difficult. So it's, it's a headache. Actually, we'll probably be quarreling <laughs> that, hey, we cannot use this. We all know these are not relevant. So uh, interdisciplinary requires a lot of effort, but it also means that when you generate, when you get something out, when you generate something new, it's going to be a new theory. Hmm? Okay, so... Um, Thanks, uh, Prof. City. So you're saying we assume that we all have teaching and learning skills. Yeah. Okay. Lecturers are trained in your speciality and not trained to be teachers. Mm, so we need pedagogies. Mm? And well, research and development, R&D and I and innovation. Huh? That's the way that we can improve. Thanks, Prof. Mm? Okay. So ladies and gentlemen,
I am going to uh, talk a little bit more about interdisciplinary research. Uh, the other day, last, last year in October, I was one of the rock stars, <laughs> rock star, me, okay, doing interdisciplinary research. Um, I think, um, so I put this picture out here. Actually, uh, do you, can you guess where this is? Where was this taken? It was taken before the pandemic. Anybody knows? You can chat or, or write out or tell me. What if I were to tell you that this is a mosque? Is it in China? It is in China, yes. Yeah. And it's a mosque in China. So yeah. it, it attracted me because I'm thinking about uh, disciplinary re interdisciplinary research needs to look at things in different ways and different methods of doing things. So it's for us in Malaysia, it's not normal to see a mosque like this, okay? But this is the inside of the mosque. So this was in Xi'an, X-I-A-N. Okay, uh, so I think it requires for inter interdisciplinary research, looking at things in different ways, different ways. That's what we are trying. So not, not what we are used to, okay? And, and to do that, so when I gave this uh, talk uh, previously in October, uh, these were some of the things that I shared, the reasons that I think uh, worked, interdisciplinary research worked for me, okay? It was because I had friends, I made friends, Okay, and we continue our friendship. And I think having friends in different uh, disciplines help us, at least when we quarrel, we, it's a friendly quarrel. We, we are not so sensitive. Okay, uh, and how to attract more friends and more colleagues to work together. Maybe we need to highlight our expertise so that in UM expert at least, or, or, or have sessions where we can meet together and get ideas all right, like right now you're coming here from different fields and you know education, you're, you're interested in doing research in education. You might be asking me, oh dear, who can I contact for uh, this kind of research? So I could help you to point out to people who are doing similar research for the education point of view, something that you may, you may need. So it helps to actually interact with people from different disciplines to get ideas, okay? And even highlight your discipline. I, I think that's one way to me. So um, arising from that talk, actually they asked us to, to come up with a chapter in book. So I dwelt deeper into that topic of um, interdisciplinary research. And there are uh, a lot of tensions <laughs> when doing inter interdisciplinary research, okay, which we will have to address. So be, um, what shall I say? Don't be discouraged if you find that ah, it's so difficult, oh, cannot, I can't work with the person that I'm working with, okay? It's a result of the tensions, which is quite natural in interdisciplinary. Multidisciplinary, you may not have this kind of tensions, huh? Okay, so without much ado, I will go into a few of the research designs that we have been doing in education, which can be applied for SOTEL, Scholarship of Teaching and Learning. There are many different types of research, okay, but I will focus on this. Is that okay with you? I'm assuming it's okay. Hmm? Um, how many of you are from the sciences? Maybe I stop. Oh, I think I can see you. Can you put up your hand? Yes, I can see that money. She's put up her hand. Science, prosody. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you are from the sciences, you're you're very very um, scientific. <laughs> you're looking at experimental designs and uh, you know. Uh, what shall I say, making it very, very clear control experiment and there has to be a significant difference. Hmm? So in educational research, 
because we are dealing with humans, it may be a little bit difficult. So I will be going through uh, all these four types of research and uh, stop me anywhere if you need more explanation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so experimental designs people who are in the sciences would have been doing such uh, experiments, control experiments, having a variable. So we also have this in education. Okay, uh, and um, just like similar to the sciences, there is or needs to be random assignment and selection of participants, okay, or maybe even matching pairs. However, in education, we have a few um, types of uh, experimental design, out of which maybe the first one, some may even say this is not not an experimental design, true, not an experimental design. So there are true experiments and quasi or quasi experiments. So in Frankenel, okay, he calls this, this pre-experimental uh, designs as uh, these two types, a one-shot case study or a one-group pre-test, post-test. So I think in education, Looking at the literature from a lot of the journals that have been published, we do a lot of um, single case study. Okay, so one group. Um, one reason could be because you're teaching, if you're teaching a class, it is quite unlikely you have two, two exact classes in a particular semester. All right, so... However, you have um, maybe one whole class where you, you are able to do one particular treatment. So treatment in this case is, it could be a new innovative method of teaching, for example. Okay, so you could uh, implement the treatment and then observe whether there is any change among the students. Not so good because uh, who knows, maybe the, the students were already very good in a particular in the first place. So it's a little bit less reliable, less valid. Okay, a little bit better is a one group pre-test, post-test. At least you observe before and observe after. So what could you observe? You could be doing things like engagement, student engagement. So if you wanted to see whether students were motivated, engaged, okay, it would be good to see before whether they were engaged, okay, when you have done uh, normal teaching, normal teaching so far, and after a particular treatment, were they better? So this design, um, I have also even published, okay, based on this design, problem solving skills for one group, whether they have improved before and after and using a t-test to see whether the improvement is significant. So even though this is a pre-experimental design, not very strong, but for the humanities, for education, it can be used. It can be used. Okay, not so good, but still, still all right. As compared to a very much stronger, better experimental design, which many of you may be familiar with, which uh, could be, uh, oh, so this one is also a pre-experimental, actually, static group design, where you take the intact group treatment, okay, and then observe them, okay, single group treatment. So I also have a single group before and after, so a pre-test, post-test comparison, static group under Frank Schnell, huh? and then a true experimental design will take participants who are randomized. So you either randomize to receive the new teaching innovation, okay, and another group, which is the control group, and observe them. So when you have that randomization, it's a little bit stronger. Hmm? And even better still, if there is a pre-test and a post-test for your treatment and control group here. Yeah. Okay, so if you are looking to publish a stronger paper, this is a better design. Okay, however, maybe um, it is a bit more difficult to 
get our students to randomize them and put them into different groups because they may be there'll be students who want to follow their friends who don't want to be with this group okay or i want to get that treatment if they know in school uh, we have even parents we, we used to do this in in school uh, so um there'll be let's say class abc they are going for this innovative teaching method then the parents will come and say, I want my child to be in this group. Can you please make sure her class, his or her class also has this? And then there'll be all sorts of, uh, you know, complaints, complaints, uh, if they find out that you're not using an innovative design. And this is natural. And this is also uh, something that has arisen in, in the research. So because of the inability, we, we cannot, we should not be unfair to certain groups. That is also a reason why we tend to take designs that do not have control groups so that we are not unfair to the participants. If we think something is innovative, we should perhaps include all the participants. And that can be a rationale. Huh? Okay. A quasi-experimental design is not randomized. Okay, but we try and have matching, matching uh, participants, it's people of similar maybe scores, maths, let's say if I'm doing something in mathematics, math sco mathematics scores in the exams, I could use similar. Or, or if I'm going to compare related to gender, I, I'll probably have same number of boys and girls, uh, you know, gender in each group. Okay, so we try to make a matching either statistically, match them statistically or physically, mechanically match them, these scores and, and so on. So we could be using a similar treatment and control group or it could, and it could also be a pre-test, post-test design, even better. So um, there are many types of experimental design, okay? Purpose is to compare variables, all right? Ideally, we want random assignment and matching, but not possible in all cases because uh, experimental design, especially that which is dealing with human beings, okay, it's very difficult to accomplish, very difficult to control uh, uh, like not unlike the experiment in the lab where you can control temperature, pressure, and so on. For people, human beings, we can't control what's on the outside. I always tell my students, like for control groups, how do you know that they are not going for tuition, extra additional tuition? They're not doing other things. And, and you know, this might also in, influence the results. So there are also extra extraneous variables that affect okay and equity like what i mentioned are we fair to the group that uh the control group that is not receiving the intervention so these are things that we have to think about so ladies and gentlemen let's have a little bit of discussion here how can we improve then our experimental design We should hide this. <laughs> so, um, Moni, yes, Moni. Uh, I'm here. Um, yeah. Prof, you mentioned about extraneous mm, variables. variables. Mm -hmm. What are those? Uh, I'm not quite sure on that. Okay. So, if you are going to compare, what do you want to compare? Engagement or better scores? Or um, I say um, better scores. Okay, so if you're going to compare scores, right? So your your um, your dependent variable is the scores. Your independent variable, you're comparing two groups, right? So these two groups are matching. You have divided them out. They are supposed to be exactly similar. And the only intervention that you give is the design of your instruction, some instructional design. However, um, among your, your students, let's say your, your two group, one group could be online, for example. Let's take this scenario. The online group, maybe half of them have problems with internet when we 
when we give a recording, maybe they can't even hear the recording. Okay, and and let's say the face-to-face -face group that we're using as a control, they are able to hear us and ask questions. Now, who will perform better? Obviously, the, uh, the one who can hear you better, right? So there could be other variables coming in, like, so in the online group, there is technical problems that could be uh, causing them a bit of problems. Maybe asking questions, maybe they don't want to ask questions so much. So they are a little bit, perhaps, perhaps shy. Let's say they are shy. So these are the extraneous variables, extra things that actually influence the design, which I, I should also compare in my study. I should say, the face-to-face -face group have more opportunities to ask questions. Face-to-face -face group can see me and hear me clearly. So these are things that I did not put in my experimental design that may be there, actually. So I hope it answers your question, Pan. I'm assuming it does, huh? <laughs> So how to combat this? That there is a, a method in all of this, uh, all of these experimental designs, good, not so good. All right, uh, there, there are problems. Actually, all not so good. Only the true experimental is the best, and that heads a bit more to quantitative. So these are not quantitative, not pure quantitative designs. So how do I improve this and and publish it? What do I do with my methodology? Anybody can guess? Or maybe uh, you have seen, yes? I have a question. Uh, it's not really about improving methodology, but I was just thinking in terms of comparisons. Let's say if I want to test a uh, innovative assignment method, right? Mm -hmm. Two classes, mm -hmm. and these groups of students are very different. Let's say one is a major in the subject that I'm teaching, whereas the other group are all non-major students. Uh -huh. and also Numbers, they are different. One is double the size uh -huh. from the other. So, mm. and I've never done this, let's say, innovative assignment before. It's my first time testing it. So how would I, with all these variables, um, how would that even match within any of these uh, mm. reasons? Okay. So from what you're telling me, it seems that as if you are doing a static group pretest process, or it could, um, because you're using two groups, huh? Yeah, um, that's not, yeah, and just uh, straight away applying that assignment because I don't really know how do you do a pretest in case of testing um, assignment approach as a way of meeting uh, learning interests and learning uptake because I'm trying to use assignment as a way of gauging learning interests and uptake. Ah, okay. So that is your problem statement. Yeah. So you actually want to uh, increase Interest, huh? <laughs> so, how I, I presume you would be having an instrument to measure their interest. Um, I'm not sure about interest, but for motivation, there are instruments that measure motivation. One of them is uh, IMMS. IMMS uh, uh, I forgot what I stands for, for it, but it's, motivational, it's a motivational survey. So uh, maybe it was internal motivational survey. So this is by Keller. Maybe you could uh, design. So if you know, if you're really having two groups and you intend to have a difference between the groups, um, you could use this instrument and gauge their motivation before. So that's the observation that you've been making. And okay. then when you have the intervention, Okay, and you will also have the same instrument done after. Okay. Uh, so that, that is how you would be doing this. Yeah, thanks for telling me. So depending on your problem statement, so everybody may have different problem statements. You could be looking at interest. Yeah, you could be looking at... Um, um, so I have done like knowledge management skills, uh, uh, of course, problem-solving skills, I, I told you earlier. So in whichever area, maybe even collaborative nature or collaborativeness, as long as you have an instrument that could measure before and after, 
Mm. So you then then it will be easy for you to uh, to make it evidence based. Okay, but um, someone could come up and say this is still not a very good experimental design. It's not a true experiment. So how do you make it even better? And any ideas, anybody? Use mix method. That means this is a little bit uh, quantitative in nature. So we are going to suggest, not, not we are going to suggest, but articles that are published which use a weak experimental design can be strengthened by using a mixed method approach. That means use a qualitative, a qualitative um, uh, strategy, okay, or support with qualitative data. So the purpose is actually to triangulate. So for example, if I take motivation, so if let's say I see the there is an improvement in motivation before and after there is a significant improvement when I do the t-test between the groups okay then I could I could say uh, yeah there seems to be a significant improvement support it with my observations ah support it with data from remember Dr. Zahe was uh, showing the data how long they spend on the LMS on teams okay we can get this, this kind of data so you can support with other data from uh, time spent on the task, they were spending more time uh, when compared, okay, uh, the first group and the second group, the first group had more time on the online platform. And then I could also say they were more interested because they seemed to ask more questions. Maybe they had more questions on the chat, okay, while they were doing it as compared to the other group, which had less questions or did not seem to be so interested. Okay, so using qualitative um, data to support. So qualitative data could include even artifacts. Uh, if you're asking your students to develop something, so you can, you can use even the things that they have developed. Maybe you ask them to develop video or write an essay. So you can use that as your data. So you can, you can even maybe compare the quality of the essay they have written or the quality of the video for the group that had the intervention was better because, so you use this. So some of this uh, research on teaching and learning, you have a lot of things like screen capture of uh, their work, students' work, uh, you could also use multiple source of data to support you. So that is part of the methodology. So when you're collecting data for, for this purpose, don't just use the survey data, record and use your observations. So do take, so if you're intending to use uh, research, yeah, the, res the group that you're using for research, Take more photos and try and keep those photos. If you're doing online screen captures, okay, and then compile all of this because this could be part of your data. You could use it for the, your data. And of course, the students' work. Yes, so I wanted to tell you that experimental design could be also very, um, very useful even though it's a weak experimental design, you can publish quite a good paper. So I've actually done uh, a lot on, on this and I had one uh, ETRD. I don't know whether you are familiar with ETRD. Um, ETRD is Educational Technology Research and Development. It is a ISI ranked journal for, for research in teaching and learning. So a lot of uh, people from different fields, engineering, um, medicine, I'm not so sure, I don't recall seeing medicine, but from many different fields have been, um, what should I say, publishing in this. So this is a possible SOTEL journal. And my last um, ISI, so it was accepted end of last year, okay, online published this year was on using virtual reality for intercultural communication. So actually, uh, it is ICC, yeah? 
So maybe I can write for you. Inter, you're seeing my writing, right? Intercultural communicative competence. So I have an instrument to measure this uh, in a before and after group. Okay, so that alone may not be sufficient. So it's supported by students' work. So students had to produce um, virtual reality environments and there was also interviews. So using all this, uh, so I show that students improve their intercultural com communicative competence Evidence by scores from the survey, evidence by also my interviews with them. Okay, so I capture certain transcripts from in students' interviews and add it in, as well as so I put in um, what uh, artifacts, show some artifacts that they have done. Okay, so um, all this together managed to get an ISI. People. So, of course, it's not easy, but, um, but can be done. So, this was a collaborative project that I did with a different, with a polytechnic, actually, and another lecturer from another university. I'll share with you more there. So, uh, thank you, Pan, for saying, uh, I, I'm glad that I helped you. So, maybe we have to look at more additional data that we can collect to support, okay? So experimental is quite good. It's quite a good um, methodology supported. So it's actually mixed, uh, supported with qualitative data. So now I'm going to go into the next area, qualitative research. Actually, when Sharifa first approached me, she asked, uh, she put there qualitative research, but I didn't want to do qualitative research alone because I think, oops, Sorry, I wanted to erase and I clicked the, <laughs> I clicked the wrong button. Uh, she wanted to do qualitative research, but I said that, uh, ah, okay, it's all clear. Qualitative research is not so, um, it's not the only kind of research, okay? But, so you have seen, uh, I have used experimental research, which is quite good and quite strong, okay? And supported with qualitative data, that would be even better. On the other hand, you might be doing just a qualitative research on your, on your students because you cannot get data in, uh, in the quantitative form. So I think that's okay too. You can also do qualitative research, but do understand that qualitative research is very, very different from quantitative it depends on an emerging design. So from the data you collect, then you start to think about, oh, what is the hypothesis? So I think maybe for our teaching research, that is the case for most of the time. We are just with our students and we don't know what we, wa we want to do with them, what we want to measure, okay? And then maybe after we implement it, then we say, oh, okay, they, they, see, they seem to be improving in this and then we, we take this and, and measure with them. So we are actually uh, having a, a design that is emerging from our data. Mm. Very, uh, very dangerous sometimes because you may be collecting and you don't know what you're collecting. I think you should have at least a little bit of uh, an idea of what you want to do, okay, before you just, you know, start to collect data, but a real quantitative, because they're quantitative designs that are ethnographic phenomenology and all that who really look at the data and let it emerge. Yeah, anybody wants to say anything? In qualitative research, the context is important. So you do it in a Classroom in the Faculty of Law in the University of Malaya is different from doing the same research in the Faculty of Education in University of Malaya. It's, the context is important. Every context is different and individual. Okay, so that is a, a good thing for, for you 
because it means you can use anything, okay, any context. And it, it is based more on narrative stories. Uh, so like telling a story. Hmm? And, and validity, you need to do a lot more triangulation. Yeah, anyone wants to ask a question? So people who are very quantitative in nature will say, hey, this research is not good, <laughs> very biased. But people from the humanities, okay, education, there are some who are very, very uh, strong. And the thing is, you have to spend a lot of time strong in their quanti uh, qualitative research designs. Huh? Um, maybe, yes, it's also true, it's more difficult to publish a pure qualitative research because it's a bit vague sometimes. We don't know what to focus on and it actually wastes, wastes a lot of time. You do a lot of time. You do spend a lot of time doing the research. But if you do succeed, it's actually quite good. It's quite, it can be quite good. Nah? So um, anyway, um, Actually, uh, come to think of it, I also haven't really, have I published pure qualitative research? I normally don't go for pure qualitative. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a type of qualitative research which you can maybe focus on. Huh? So qualitative is inductive analysis, um, different from the positivist where you have your theories, you know what you want to research on, okay? So it tends towards postmodernist, okay, a bit, bit more vague, huh? <laughs> a bit more vague and exploring, okay, what you want to do. So uh, the focus of uh, qualitative research is the phenomena. So what is the phenomena? So it's not like uh, just now um, the quantity or experimental research, you have your variables there already. But now here, it is the phenomena that we want to study. So I put this picture here because I think uh, this was a very like qualitative kind of thing. So I like to see interactions on a virtual platform. So this is a virtual world. Okay, so I have here Rex and Help Me. Mm -hmm. And then um, my phenomena is how do people, how do students interact in a virtual world if I give them activities? So that was, that in fact was something that I did <laughs> during the pandemic time. Let them go there. And you know what, what I found out when the students were first put into the virtual world, it was their first experience. When they went in, they all started running around. I couldn't conduct any lecture because they were, whoops, here, there, whoa, whoa, everywhere. Okay, so my phenomena was uh, um, studying how they interacted. Mm, not too good. So I, I could from there, uh, so that's my scholarship. Huh? If I wanted to give them uh, a lecture, I wouldn't use a virtual world. Instead, maybe I'll just ask them to explore. I'll put things there and let them explore on their virtual world, on the virtual world. So I learned something from my, my exploration but I didn't publish that. Huh? <laughs> so um, identification of the participants also is important. It's purposive sampling, uh, most of the case, as compared to random sampling, identifying a population. That's what we do in surveys. But here we are very specific and it fits well if we are doing for our, our class, our classes. Then um, hypothesis, so... Uh, so you see, uh, my, I wanted to see how they communicated, but then finally they were all running around. So I had to say probably my hypothesis had to be refined by saying that students do not or are distracted in the virtual world, <laughs> perhaps something like that. So the hypothesis comes from the data. Okay, so data collection method, uh, I could use my observation, but I must also ask the students I must also get the artifacts, maybe like photos like this to see how they communicated or where they went to. Videos, perhaps, to show how they moved about. Okay, and then I can proceed to analyze, to find teams that showed, okay, they were not so interested. Okay, then I could interpret and draw my conclusion that 
not so suitable. So that's where I draw my conclusion. Perhaps I can give them things to explore. Maybe put my uh, lecture, lecture notes there and they explore. Not you come and find me because they will never look at me, but they will go and look at things to explore. So this is something um, that uh, I actually did. Uh, scholarship, <laughs> not published, huh? not shared. Hmm. So approaches to qualitative research, as I mentioned, there are many approaches, narrative style, autobiographical, life history, which may, may or may not be applicable in education, phenomenology, which will take too long to study in detail the phenomena, or grounded theory, I wouldn't recommend this, ethnographic and historical uh, a bit too much, but actually what we are doing in our case studies could be ethnographic. It could be looking at how students react, uh, the interaction, the virtual world, in a virtual world. But what I am going to recommend is case studies. So this one is a little bit better and I think can be published. Uh, yeah, it's a bit more difficult. So qualitative research um, but if you support it with data that is that is a bit more tangible, that has some quantitative in it, okay, it can be a case study. So a case study, a case could be even one participant, especially if that participant is a special case, a special needs student or a, a special student, okay, what's so special about that individual? one classroom, one institution, or even one program. So you could put a case study of a program. And when you are doing case study with one program, you can actually uh, include in their scores, their marks. So it's not real pure quantitative, but it is making use of their quantitative. Okay, I'm looking at Clary's question. Sometimes with collaborators publish qualitative research in experiential learning. Ah, okay. So actually, yeah, you can publish qualitative. Definitely, there is a potential. Um, if it's a very unique case, you can even, even publish in an ISI journal, uh, ISI level journal. Okay, so uh, Prof. City has asked, how can... Measure behavior change in learning attitudes. Huh? Hmm. Okay. Well, Prof, it depends on uh, what, you, what you want to measure. So um, behavioral change for learning attitudes is, 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 is a bit difficult. Yeah. Okay. What attitude do you want to measure? But I have to, um, I mean, we, we have to look at the attitudes. So like motivation, I have shared with you one scale. Okay, um, so you can use, you can attempt to use the uh, attitude uh, scale. So I'm, th I'm thinking of other attitude scales as well. So there are in psychology uh, scales for certain attitudes. So we, we, we probably have to dive down. Huh? And uh, I would say whether you use qualitative or quantitative, depends on the number of participants also. So if you have a class, like if I'm doing a research with my postgraduate class, I will have only less than 10 in the class. So if that's the case, I have no choice but to use qualitative. So I would use probably, so there might be a, a scale for measuring, let's say, ethical, uh, you know, they are, they are or even professionalism, teaching professionalism, or leadership, educational leadership, there are scales for measuring educational leadership. So if let's say I want to measure their educational leadership while uh, doing activities in my class, I could use that scale, but because there are only 10 students, I will have to go to a qualitative approach. So I would say, I can't remember what the components of, or the constructs in the scale. So let's say construct one, I will have to find evidence from either interview or artifacts and then start to, um, to what do you call, defend and say that, oh, this particular batch of students have 
got this particular construct of educational leadership. Okay, and the second, second construct, go and find out. So I'm starting here with the theory. So this is a very, so I will talk more about that also actually. So I have a theory in mind and I analyze the data based on the theory, based on the measures that are ready made. Okay, so um, yes, Prof, so there are attitudes, so it depends on how, how your, the number of students that you have. If you're doing an undergraduate class, undergraduate classes are larger and have more students, so it is possible to use quantitative, okay? Especially, so my recommendation with my students is 30. Minimum of 30 would be quite good, but sometimes... Uh, because we plan for a minimum of 30, uh, but in actual case, not sometimes not all 30, maybe less than 30. I've, I've published an ISI paper also where there were only about uh, 16 to 19 students in that, in that particular class, which uh, I use quantitative data, but I supported with qualitative data. That was on collaborative learning. So their method of collaboration. So it is still acceptable. That means it can because if you have quantitative, even though not, that means it is um, uh, what do you call non-parametric data because less uh, less than uh, thirty is a bit dangerous. Your your data might be non-parametric, so non-parametric data supported with qualitative data. I have a quick question on that matter. Uh, this okay. is like a the original scenario web I posted on using um, assignment as a way of gauging uh, student motivation and learning uptake. So mm -hmm. let's say back to these two classrooms, as I say, one is double the size of the other, but one is actually under 20 mm -hmm. and the other could be 30 or it could be slightly under 30. I'm not entirely uh -huh. sure. Mm -hmm. So how, I, how would I compare between these two? Because they are so different and it's not even like 100 to 80. It's like really under... Yeah. 15 and over 20. If you're doing the real quantitative style, you have to actually um, find the effect size, right? Okay, so that you can compare, make a proper comparison between the two groups. But before that, you'll have to check whether the data is parametric or non-parametric. So because it's so small, the group is uh, it's very likely is non-parametric. Huh? So it's a little bit dangerous so so but anyway do report so like in my case the the particular case that i i mentioned where i published even though it's so small but there was one group huh? so it was non-parametric i reported that it was non-parametric okay and and however it had to be analyzed with with what huh? but it was almost um non-parametric according to the test like shafiro will shafiro wilts and and so on, chromo chromograph. I can't pronounce their names. <laughs> okay, but because uh, of uh, I use the QQ plot as well, so it try to justify the the particular uh, data was you know almost aligned, so it approaches parametric. So I assume that is parametric, and analyze it using t test. So that's something that. You could try. If not, if not, then you just report it that way. So uh, again, it depends on what kind of journal you are you are using. ISI journals will be definitely more critical uh, of the approaches and the analysis. So if it's non-ISI, maybe this one, if it's both non-parametric and you cannot cannot possibly change it, <laughs> then maybe you have to actually try and remove some of the outliers and see whether it becomes better or not. Failing which, then you report it as it is. Hmm? Okay, thanks. Oh, okay. Prof City, you asked me such a philosophical question. <laughs> Attempting to quantify the intangible. It is true. It is, um, it is something that, uh, you know, we should not be trying to quantify the intangibles. But on the other hand, we try to make it more 
in psychometrics especially, we try and uh, try and measure all those attitudes and feelings and and what other things that we we might be we might be having and might be measuring. So yes, uh, there is uh, there is always a philosophical you know disagreement. Perhaps it is sometimes not fair to quantify and make decisions. So because of that, mixed method research could be a better approach. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm. So ISI and uh, if they're not in ISI, you may um, not scopus. You may even look for book chapters. Book chapters are easier to publish uh, like qualitative research and so on. Huh? Okay, did I miss any questions? Okay, so back to our cases. So I was going to cases. So we, you could also look at a program that you are doing uh, for a case study. Case study, okay. And in the case study that you need to determine the what we call the boundary. So if it's one program, it's one program. If it's one classroom, it's one classroom. So that's the, the theory or the methodology needs to have a boundary so that you don't you know, include everything because with qualitative research, sometimes it gets too big and very hard to control. There's so much things, remember like extra variables, variables. There's so many things that can influence um, you know, the learner. So we need to have a boundary to determine our scope. Okay, so that we state, if we are going to write a paper on it, we state outright what is the boundary and how we're going to, how we're going to control it. Mm -hmm. So sampling in qualitative research as in case studies, similar, you could take either a typical student to 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 explore or, or consider. Could be one, two, three, or four students. Or you could take critical, a critical sample, special students, students who are doing very well, okay, uh, students who are having some difficulties, maybe some attitude problems. So if you want to measure attitude, a person with very good attitude in your class or one which has problems. Okay, so you could also sample homogeneously or you could take extreme cases to consider. Okay, students are doing very well and doing very badly. Extreme case sample. So theoretical, if you, want, if you have a theory in mind and specifically select them so that you can investigate that particular theory, okay, or whoever, whoever, whatever. Now, nowadays, we do a lot of... Uh, data collection on like Facebook and social media, that is actually like opportunistic sampling. We just, whoever contacts, okay, uh, that are available, okay, we get the sample. Confirming sample purposely to confirm the case. Maximal variation, the sample that we choose that will show the maximal variation. And snowball, friends of friends of friends, which increase the, the sampling. That is also in social media nowadays. So we could use any one of these type of sampling in our case studies, okay? Uh, and, and, and to help you get an idea of analysis, I put out content analysis. I have used content analysis in, um, in, in analyzing communications, online communications with my students. So, there are three types of approaches of uh, content analysis. Oh, I see here, double S. Okay, uh, with Bahia and uh, Shannon. So we have the content analysis, which is the conventional content analysis. is very much like um, qualitative research where the coding comes from the text itself. There is no theory there's no starting theory. It is an inductive approach. So when I look through the students' texts from online communication, let's say discussion forums, I uh, will quote, okay, I underline and quote this as, uh, let's say, interest. Okay, another one is just noise. 
just making, uh, just writing without any purpose. Okay, I call it. I categorize it as noise. Okay, or I then I see something else and I say, oh, this is critical thinking, higher order thinking involved. So I, I quote, you know, uh, and the themes that I use emerge from the data when I see it. So that is basically what qualitative analysis uh, is like. Okay, you could have from no theory and inductive approach, you generate the quotes as you go along. Okay, and then later on, by looking at the coding, you will be determining what actually is the theory. So you'll be checking other theories that are around and trying to make conclusions from the theories. Hmm. Ah, I normally do not inform the students on the objectives in, in that case. That, that means what I'm what I'm studying, yeah, because that might be a, a and in fact, it's, it's, in fact, all students um, might, might be influenced actually, yeah, where we tell them that there's an intervention indirectly also, they, they might be more excited to do it. So it is a little bit, uh, yeah, uh, possibility that if we tell them too much, it would influence. It's just like, an experimental design, yeah, they, they, they know that you expect certain things of them. So the threat to an experimental design, if you tell them it's possible that uh, you influence their results, they know that you're going to look at educational leadership and they purposely show better leadership styles and, and influences. It is true. Okay, so um, we try to tell them a little bit, but not too much. Hmm? So that you can influence oh, either that or we have to we have to also support by if it's quantitative, qualitative data. So okay, pure pure qualitative analysis would take this kind of approach, very inductive in nature. Whereas a directed content analysis will be very specific. You have the theory in mind. So for my case, uh, in the paper that I published, I actually use directed content analysis on communities of inquiry. So there is a theory there about presence, about cognitive presence, social presence, teacher presence, okay, and, and so on. So as I analyze the, the writings, okay, I will uh, code it according to the theory that I have. So, oh, this is cognitive presence. Oh, this shows, uh, this shows what? This shows social presence. This shows teacher presence. Okay, and and so on. So that is a very deductive approach. So in your um, analysis, it depends. Okay, for a real qualitative, let's say interview, you would probably have transcribed the data transcribe all the interviews, and then you will be doing your coding. So you could code it inductively, or you could use a deductive approach and code it from the theory that you have. Or you could use a different approach. So uh, summative content analysis involves counting. How many said this? How many said that? So for me, I, I will say that in the case study, you could use this, the number of times this appeared, or if it's related to education, the number of times the students did this, okay, did a particular thing or showed a particular concern, perhaps, or showed a particular attitude. So I use this as my basis for analysis, although it's content analysis, which is a very qualitative approach as well. Ah, uh, yeah. So to me, <laughs> Yong Un. Okay, I think, yes, it is. To, to me, that's why I put it here. It has the same principles as, as thematic analysis for the qualitative data. So I put it here because uh, for those who are less familiar with qualitative approach, you may not know um, what is thematic approach, but yes, you are right. 
So content analysis is from the communications and text uh, normally. Yeah? So sometimes it's also not called a qualitative approach. Uh, it is sometimes on its own, not pure qualitative. Okay, so these are the emerging themes when you use the inductive approach. Sorry, Dr. Dorothy, can yes. I ask? Um, yes, yes. The previous slide, yeah. I, I just wonder, like, for example, when we talk about conventional content analysis, right? Hmm? Um, does that mean that since we said we don't, um, because um, the next one has um, hmm. theory as a guidance. So hmm. does that mean, mean that the conventional, we actually start from scratch without the theories? Yeah, we'll start what? You start from scratch without the theories, but later on, you will have to search for the theories. And that is what qualitative research is about. They start from scratch and then they look at how the data emerging from the analysis, from the teams, fits into existing theories or whether it is a new theory. So actually, that is the approach for a qualitative, a pure qualitative analysis. So okay. to compare these two, actually, is it safer if we have directed content analysis? Safer. Nah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so if you want to be, you want to be safe, yes, direct content, directed content analysis. Similarly, for the qualitative also, if you want to be safe, you have the theoretical, you know, background first, the theory, the framework first, and then you work on it. That's a safe qualitative analysis. But if you want to be uh, exploratory and uh, people who, who are, you know, who dare to take chances sometimes have very, very good, you know, uh, research. And that's also a possibility of ISI paper. Mm -hmm. The more exploratory research approach could give you better results. All right, all right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you, you see, depending on your time and your how much effort you need, uh, you see which kind of approach you, you will take. Maybe if you're exploring directed one with the theory there is safer. It's safer, yes. Mm -hmm. But if you have time, you may explore. <laughs> okay, so the other type of research that I promise to do is action research. Action research is defined as solving a problem. Okay, and using the information to inform local practice by Frank Miller, huh? he says that. So actually, when you are a teacher and a lecturer, instructor, and you have, let's say, students, are you, these students uh, not interested or whatever, that is a problem to solve. And you do something, you implement something to solve this problem that could be action research. So... It's uh, less rigorous, actually. Okay, it's your interest, so it focuses on what you need, you and your classroom. Okay, uh, less rigorous, huh? but you need to identify the problem and identify action plans. So the keyword is the action plans. So the data you collect is based on the action plan. You want to evaluate whether it is suitable or not. So action research has been done in not only in education, in other fields, in management as well. Okay, And there are different types of action research. It could be practical because of the problem you want to solve, or it could be participatory group kind of research. So to me, if you're using participatory, it might be a program where a group of lecturers are involved in solving the problem. But if you're doing your own class, it could be just a practical action research meant for yourself. So meant for your, your consumption, but your consumption, you could also use, um, you could also publish. Eh? Okay, so participatory could also have actually good potential for publication. So the steps in action research involves identifying the research question, necessary information, analyzing. So is this qualitative or quantitative? What do you think?
it could it's normally put under qualitative but it could have quantitative elements like sometimes the information that you are gathering could be um class scores you could be doing experimental before and after you could use that kind of information so there might be elements of quantitative you could be using things like the time spent on the task if it's online you can measure how long they were online watching the videos that you gave them online doing the quiz doing the forum accessing individuals so that's where um Uh, teams microsoft teams and and even even spectrum we have that capability yeah we are able to get a report on the students uh, each individual students how much they spend how much time they spend on a particular activity okay and then we can analyze and interpret interpret it again to be a very good research to be published you should probably have quantitative data like i mentioned earlier like the experimental and data and support and triangulate with some qualitative data and other artifacts mm. okay yeah so interviews focus group discussion are the methodology so you notice here i didn't put the methodologies here so gathering the necessary information can be done through many research uh, techniques so i would say the interviews focus group that is the, that is the tech, those are the techniques for data collection okay which you can use here so it's not limited to that okay observations researchers journals your journal your diary yeah, of what the students did can also be put in so you can say researcher observed that Uh, what you observe so those those are things that can be put in when you are publishing action research so i have uh, some of my students also have published action research papers but uh, so far not isi la huh? uh, but if the data is good why not you can always try so sampling will be very limited individuals in the context of the study So there are threats to validity, of course. So uh, how can we generalize? No generalization. It is to that particular context, and how to reduce the threats to validity? Get uh, quantitative and qualitative data to help you to support okay, interviews, focus group, or otherwise hmm, can be used to help support the the findings. Okay, all right. So I'm going to go on to the next research. Any any questions on action research? A uh, quick question. Uh, okay. How do we handle consent in this case? I mean, consent, especially if we want to use maybe a classroom recording that is meant for use in classroom, but you may want to use data from that, even if you do not, even if you anonymize participants. Mm -hmm. But how will you get consent in this case, especially done after the fact rather than done? Yeah. Yeah. So actually, uh, I I have uh, done research with my part my students, uh, my participants. I get them to sign a uh, indemnity or participant consent form, <laughs> so tell them that I will be using data from our class, okay, uh, for their research. So I do not specify, you know, what what kind of data. Uh, that I'm collecting, but I I will say that any communications, okay, any uh, videos that you produce, okay, or or what other things are uh, that will be collecting as data, could be used could be used, okay, for uh, publication for for research for research. Hmm? So I get them to agree. If there are any so far, none of them have disagreed. Like if there are any who disagree. Uh, sometimes they they are a bit late in returning their form, so I will ask them, is, "Is it because you disagree? It's okay, don't have to agree." Uh, but many of them have so far always send back and say, "Okay, nah." Uh, so using that, that is your participant, your informed consent, participants informed consent. However, actually, um, all our uh, research actually we should get approval, ethical approval from. 
from UMREC, right? UMREC. Okay. Uh, so if you are doing a research that is how controversial in any way, or if you have planned uh, to do your research, like for me, if I'm using a grant, definitely I will get UMREC content. Yes, ethics clearance with questionnaire. So if, if you have especially questionnaires that um, are uh, sensitive, better get clearance, okay? If, it, if something that may harm the participants, definitely you need, definitely need clearance. If it's something uh, that doesn't cause harm, it's less likely and many journals don't, don't require you to have approval, okay? But it's good practice because I know the ISI ranked journals may ask you for your ethical approval. Okay, so if you think that um, any of your research requires um, what you call uh, you know ethics clearance, uh, do do ask for ethics clearance. But ethics clearance, I know, takes time, takes a little bit of effort, but it's also good practice. Otherwise, at least protect yourself by using the participant consent form, okay? Just in case anything happens. Hmm? Okay, thank you for that question. Very, very relevant and very good question. Huh? Uh, so uh, publication, not all publications require the ethics clearance, but ISI publications, I notice, do ask. Uh, but... Um, not all, okay. Some ISI publications, but they are starting to be more aware and asking. So far, none of uh, the ones that I published with that I intended to publish, yes, they did ask um, for ethics clearance. There was one ethics clearance number, okay, but most of them are not. Hmm? Okay, let's go into design and developmental research. This is a, a research framework and methodology that we use in my faculty when we're doing research on uh, developing new curriculum, new instructional products, because uh, this is a very, uh, well, very good method. I will have to, um, uh, I, I think that this, this form of research is very good, okay, uh, because it, it has three phases, okay, I'll tell you about the three phases, and I feel that it is, um, um, what shall I say, um, the validity and the reliability of the research is strengthened with these phases, okay, let me, let me tell you what happens, okay? In the design and developmental research, there are normally three to four phases like this, okay? In, you will probably have a problem to solve. You will start with a problem, problem statement, and in your problem statement, you may have lots of literature already justifying the need for a particular, uh, particular model, curriculum, module, Okay, or intervention, all right? But sometimes you are not sure whether it is applicable for a particular group of students or group of participants. So that's where the needs analysis comes in. You have a problem, you verify whether the context, okay, that you are looking at really has that particular problem. So that's identifying the need. So if it were something related to attitude, since we're talking about attitudes here, so the you could verify, depending on the number of participants you have, qualitative or quantitative uh, methods to see whether there is a gap, whether there is a need for that particular problem. 
Okay, so the methods in BDR are quite uh, uh, re relaxed in that sense that you have multiple methods. You could use interviews, you could use quantitative data. So there are different methods of addressing the, the needs. Okay, and then in the design phase, design, you could be using interviews. Normally, designs are done with experts. So you could be using interviews. You could be using um, a specific tech, uh, uh, methodology. Like we use a lot of Delphi techniques, fuzzy Delphi techniques to get consensus among experts. Okay. Uh, so this is not you as a lecturer alone design, but normally getting... There are many ways of doing, of course, it could be one way is you as a lecturer design. Another way could be you getting experts in designing the module evaluation, the curriculum, okay, whatever you're, you need to evaluate. Then you develop it and then implement and evaluate. Now, what was the problem in the beginning? If it was a lack of certain uh, attitudes or skills, let's look at it. At the end, did you manage to improve it with your design and look at the effectiveness? Okay, so again, there are multiple approaches uh, that you can use. <coughs> Sorry, quantitative, qualitative, based on an instrument or, or collecting artifacts. Hmm? <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so... I like it, and uh, we do this. Uh, this is susceptible for PhD in our faculty because uh, it actually has very. It's a cyclic process. Actually, <coughs> you verify that there is a problem, you design for the problem, and if you get experts involved, it is even much stronger to to verify the problem, and then when you evaluate, you evaluate to see whether that problem still exists. If it does. It's okay. I mean, you cannot guarantee that what you develop um, will solve the problem. It's okay, but you, um, you have an, at least made an effort and you can find out what doesn't work and what works, if any. Okay, so that you can go for another second round if required. So it could be done in several. There have been papers published which have published first round and the effects from the first round used for improvement of a second round, okay, and, and so on. But with our PhD students, uh, if it is strong enough, you can even publish, so we can get them to publish their needs analysis, even the design phase, as well as even the evaluation or overall. Or you could have a paper that covers, especially if you have published earlier, it could reference the needs analysis stage, and, and publish uh, the final evaluation. Okay, so I, I can recommend um, this methodology when you do your research with your students, okay, you can look at their needs and that alone can be one area of research. If you have a good enough instrument or a good enough theory, okay, this alone can, can actually get a lot of uh, data for publication, okay? And then the evaluation, the design phase, depending if, um, if you use a very good methodology like a Z Delphi method, there is potential for publication, but then not all journals. Uh, many journals don't recognize uh, pre previously uh, when I, I first started this, uh, not many journals, but I have published one or two in ISI journals on fuzzy Delphi technique. Okay, so this is a, a, a good and a systematic uh, way of developing. So it's a design and developmental research for producing products, tools, enhanced models. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, any questions on this one? So you see that the research methodology um, that uses a variety of data 
both qualitative and quantitative is a better and more reliable methodology. Yeah? Quantitative and qualitative. Okay, no questions? So if I were to go on, all right, I have a question there, I think. Design, yeah, yeah, actually it's quite similar. Yeah, Prof, uh, similar to design thinking. Yeah? So design thinking, but design thinking has, uh, of course, different names. Uh, and um, in this particular design developmental research, uh, this comes from the US, uh, Richie and Klein, uh, researchers from the United States. So um, let me see, I want to... I want to annotate. We, we have words like design-based research. The UK tend to use more design-based research. Okay, so these are the proponents are Laurie Lard, I think, okay, and, and friends, okay, Laurie Lard. Uh, and um, you mentioned about design thinking. Uh. Design thinking, if you... Yeah, actually, it's used for products. So design thinking would be more for products rather than, um, I'm not sure whether it can be used for curriculum. So it has a process of ideation, I think. Okay, so in a, in a way, it is similar and yet it's different. Okay, it is like design thinking. So if you're using design developmental research for designing a product, uh, then yes, possible that you use design thinking capabilities. Uh. Whereas if you look here, you see it starts with needs analysis rather than the ideation to get a product to solve the problem. Okay, but I think the design and evaluation are in, in the phases of design thinking. Okay, so I am going to erase this and carry on with the next one. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. So I have, um, we have done actually, me and my colleagues, a, a lot of research on uh, um, this de design developmental research. Uh, when I got the UM Lighter grant, my first UM Lighter grant, only first and only, Okay, in 2017, um, we, I used this for a group of undergraduate students to get them to collaborate and develop their technological, pedagogical content knowledge. So these are counselling students who actually need to design interventions to teach others who may be students, who might be even the public. Okay, so I got them to... Uh, so these counseling undergraduates develop materials from infographics to videos, okay, and other other things, okay, other other that means they had activities as well, okay. They had to design activities to to perform interventions in in schools and other places that they were handling it. So I use we use this needs analysis for students to to get the need from the community that they wanted to help, okay, design and develop intervention, which were actually evaluated by, evaluated by experts, okay, on the possibility of their, their intervention uh, working out. And then, evalu uh, however, we didn't go through right through the implementation and evaluation uh, phases, but they had the product, the prototype evaluated, okay? Uh, implementation, there was no time for it, okay? So the end, but I published a little bit on their, so I got the UM REC approval for this, okay? Published a bit on the infographics that they did, okay? And uh, some of the materials that they produced. Hmm? Another of my students uh, did, uh, follow the Emerald training programs with permission from ADAC, okay, to, in collaboration with ADAC, and um, develop a collaborative key pack for lecturers. So this uh, also had uh, several phases. So one of the first phases, the needs analysis, okay, was, uh, was published, 
okay, analysis of the collaborative tools used by lecturers before the intervention. Okay, so we did find that uh, lecturers were using things like videos, but I think more as just showing it rather than, uh, so this was TPEC in 29, uh, before 2019, not 2018. Okay, so we have come up with tools that are, are useful according to what you're teaching. So if you're teaching um, uh, intellectual skills, if you're teaching attitudes, there might be certain tools which are more suitable than others. So pro city uh, attitudes, uh, teaching using like videos was very, very much uh, relevant. Getting students to produce videos was also very, very important in teaching attitudes. So that's, that's what uh, she found out. Uh, this particular student of mine in her design phase, she went uh, to meet with many instructional designers from all the way from, from UUM right down to uh, UTM. Okay, so she met with instructional designers, got their opinions okay, on what are the suitable tools for what particular skills okay, and what particular uh, uh, areas in according to Merrill's first principles of instruction. So uh, actually some of her work has also been published uh, in the intellectual skills and so on. Okay, and then uh, I've also used this design uh, with uh, so um, on basic life support with a nurse who is doing her PhD uh, with us. Okay, so the design phase, and this was a fuzzy Delphi technique, actually how to design it. Okay, on the, remember the intercultural communicative competence? Originally, uh, we used this without virtual reality to determine this in the Malaysian Polytechnic. So that was, can be considered, it was actually a uh, final one. It was finally the evaluation, okay, which I use, I can use as my um, needs analysis if I want to do for virtual reality. I've also we have also looked at problem solving skills using this design. <clears throat> so developing so during the design phase, experts were involved. Okay, and and then finally could be evaluating it as well. Okay, so uh, developing. <clears throat> so when it comes, so you can see from the title when there's a design, you know, it's it's a design phase. Developing is the development phase related to design. And um, like in this case here, it's not, de not developing, but it's the final stage, yeah? the problem-solving flipped classroom model. So these were some of the journals that we published in. And I have been doing uh, with some of our colleagues in different, different uh, faculties. So with my friend, hey, Eric, we did this uh, knowledge management processes using Padlet. Uh, so Padlet is a virtual wall. So it's quite, it, this is an ISI paper. Huh? So it's, a, it's quantitative as well as excerpts or interviews and, and uh, what they have written on the virtual wall as well. Okay, so my colleague, my friend, okay, Wan Lee, <laughs> I consider this a needs analysis. Maybe we, we, plan, we plan so many times to, to have something uh, implemented but couldn't but couldn't get grants mm. so grants is one of the KPI so perhaps this is a needs analysis phase that we can we can refer we will refer to if we need and this was the one that I was telling you about the virtual reality which I did with my friends okay in a different institution mm. and um so this is ISI. So there is poss possibility for publication in ISI journals as well. This is the one, this is what we use actually for my um, award that I got, the, the last award. Mm -hmm. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, now over to you. So we have about one hour for you to share and give me your ideas. Should I stop sharing so that I can see your face? <laughs> see your faces? Okay, what kind of research are you thinking of?
to me, I feel uh, the theory is also important in a good research. If, um, as you are thinking, as you are thinking about your questions and um, your approach, uh, then let me let me share again maybe some of the some of the things that I I publish uh, with my students. Oops. Okay, wanted to show you uh, this particular paper. Effectiveness of gamification. So this is a, a paper that we sent for publication. It's still under review. Okay, but I, um, I hope it, it will be published soon. Okay, so she has done it with... Um, Year four students, primary school students in Mandarin as second language, using an app called Class Dojo. So Class Dojo is very uh, fun and cute, and the uh, young kids love it. Mm, I don't know whether undergraduates would like it or not. <laughs> so what she did was a quasi experimental design, pre test, post test, okay, for 30, 30 years. So we tried to when we are designing, try to put at least 30, okay? And then the scores, hopefully, okay, would be parametric, okay? And data from achievement. So what I wanted to show you here was besides the um, quantitative data, achievement like badges collected and other engagement were analyzed to find out how participants were engaged. So things like, high rate of attendance, task completion, you see? So these are the positive behavior and the favorable perceptions in which we could analyze. Hmm? Okay, so I won't go through the, I want to show you the data, I think. I don't think we need to go through what was the problem and the theories. So anyway, you had a, a glance at it, huh? self-determination theory. Oh, Okay, and gamification, which is different from game-based learning. So use technology. Technology has there's so many possibilities okay, with technology and use it to, to engage your students and have fun. So uh, the, this is the theoretical framework if you'd like to see. Oops, sorry. So gamification using what badges, avatars, leaderboards, hmm? and pupils' engagement measured. So engagement, so there's a theory for engagement. Okay, it's measured by cognitive, emotional, and behavioral engagement and self-determination. Okay, it's a theory that is related to it for Mandarin achievement. Okay, so let's look at the some of the data. Okay, so uh, before data, uh, she also explained. So this is class dojo, right? Eh? So you see how it looks like. <laughs> There's a monster. So young children love monsters. Undergraduates love monsters, so I'm sure. Okay, parents lock in available. Okay, and um, there are badges which are given, and these badges can be given by. That means you can, you can also design the badges. I want to have a skill like leadership that I want to evaluate, okay, and put this in as well. So your students are given badges and this is the students in the group, okay, and well, I think like their scores, their badges and all that can be shown. Okay, so... So effectiveness was measured using a pre-test, post-test. So you see how it's reported, the t-test. Hmm. And slight, significantly higher than the, the post-test was significantly higher than the pre-test marks. Okay, so this is the quantitative part. So there seems to be a positive effect on the academic achievement, right? Then we looked at engagement. 
So looking at what attendance, task completion, so analysis of attendance was tabulated. Okay, how many percent? Okay, and then the um, class that was scheduled. Oh, by the way, I just tell you about this particular Mandarin class. This is not a class in school, you know, it is outside of the school timetable. So for you to get 100% attendance is not possible, but to get 80% attendance was very good. Okay. Um, so there, there was a, a fall in the number of attendance, attendance, okay, but still not so not so bad now. Nah. Hmm? Majority of them were still engaged with gamification as most of them were more willing to come for extra classes. Okay. But um, this was not a compulsory class. So that's why there were attendances that were not 100%. Hmm? Task completion, whether completed all tasks, mostly completed or completed some of the tasks. So maybe to explain, we look at the figure. So, well, this is out of school. This has no, um, not an exam class. Okay, So not everybody completed the task. It was limited. Okay, So the problem is this Mandarin as a, a second language is taken by students who are non-Mandarin speaking. Hmm? Yeah, prof. <laughs> I agree. The innovation culture is missing. Um, but we probably have to like we have to use other universities as an example. I think uh, like um, Harvard, Stanford, they all have a, a center, a faculty, a, a, a body that actually encourages innovation in teaching and learning. And uh, like for them, I, I did a little bit of study here uh, a few years back. They actually called um, volunteers from among the students. So if they wanted to, let's say, implement virtual reality, yeah, you, you don't have to get your class, impact class, you know. You have a, a body and uh, that particular center will probably say, we're going to do this innovation for this particular class, la, la, la. And open up to the whole campus. Let's say you have a criteria, like undergraduate students, you could even put the... the the program that they are doing and invite them all, you know. So you get willing, uh, these are willing participants. Uh, sometimes, of course, this willingness comes with a cost. So there is normally, uh, I, I notice uh, uh, maybe a $20 voucher, 20 ringgit voucher or, or something like that when you participate. So students are very interested and they love participating in this uh, program, I, I, when I was in Australia, I, re I remember uh, some of the students were saying, oh, do we have this? We, we, we want, that's, that's how they get their extra money, shopping money. Okay, $20 voucher, $20 voucher, collect, 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 and, and look for more, you know, people doing research. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think innovation will have to be uh, uh, emphasis soon. We'll, we, we will start it depends on our, our heads, our bosses. The innovation culture actually needs to be implemented if we want to perform well. Um, I don't know what we have to do. So perhaps, Prof, it depends on people like you to, to uh, sound out <laughs> to the institution that we need to advocate this culture and one way is looking at our rankings I think since we are very very um, I mean the university ranking is very important right uh, so what more okay putting forward all the innovative teaching and learning practices that we do that should be the way to attract international students put forward the ODL it's not just the rankings in the 
in the subjects, the scholarship in our research areas, but also the innovative teaching. I've noticed, um, we have noticed actually our, our task force that looked at innovative teaching have noticed that in other universities, uh, they highlight lecturers who have done innovative teaching. So highlight the awards. So that's one thing that we can do in, in our faculties and at our universities, highlight lecturers who have done innovative teaching, who have won awards at the international and national level. National level, I know many of us are there. <laughs> yeah, we are all scared to make mistakes. Uh, hi, yes. Quick yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I only joined UM last year, so I was working in other universities before that. Uh -huh. uh, I joined UM that I'm not sure whether this is common practice everywhere or maybe it's specific to my faculty, where usually, like, if you're a new lecturer in a university, you actually be the observation in your teaching by your uh, more senior colleagues in your head of department, right? To okay, make you not screwing up and also to see if you're doing anything interesting that can be highlighted as well. So that's how. But I noticed uh, since I joined UM that hasn't really happened. So, and I think that means junior colleagues are also not getting guidance, especially if they have no TN, no teaching experience. And even if there's anything innovative done, right? Unless uh, you have a very uh, motivated head that kind of scrutinizes everybody's uh, syllabus, which I think most are too overburdened to even do. Yeah, it probably they wouldn't they won't even really know that. Or uh, there's anything innovative that's done in your teaching until maybe curriculum review and they actually look at what you are doing at the cost level, which is like five years probably down the line. <laughs> you are like that when there's not really, I'm not saying policing because that's also a bad way, but kind of like way of actually monitoring such things. Mm -hmm. And because there's also not much emphasis on uh, teaching in UM. I think uh, because for what I hear is that, I mean, everyone is very busy chasing um, other things because they get, um, how do I say that, a better rewards in other ways, right? And teaching kind of gets sidelined. And also, you know, and there's also this idea that for some people, they take up teaching because they want to make up for KPI lacking in other areas as well. But I see that also. So, you know, teaching becomes like the stepchild, you know, I do it because it's a fallback plan for me because I'm not gaining points in other areas. So there's, so, so, so there's not as much pride in teaching, I know, this year compared to like even in some private universities where everything is kind of like mm -hmm. scrutinized. Yeah, I think it's also because, you know, in private universities, for the most part, they depend a lot on students for revenue. So they have to make sure their teaching is up on par. Whereas UM doesn't have that same kind of concern. I don't know it's just like an observation mm. and maybe other universities you know they feel okay fine you know we can't catch up on the more traditional way why don't we really show ourselves by being really good you know getting students attention through teaching rather than just having a brand name that may or may not last yeah yeah actually I think you're right you know Clarissa I think uh, we have um we lack the focus on uh, teaching. We do not focus on teaching and especially innovative teaching. Right now, we are still okay because we, we are still high in the rankings, huh? but it is a bit dangerous. If we do not have lecturers having innovative teaching, we may lose out huh, in the end. I think our other local universities are spending more money on innovative teaching and learning and focusing on innovative teaching. So we have to be careful um, because uh, we may lose the students and in that way, we also lose the revenue. We still depend on our students. So, but we are very comfortable doing research in our own discipline. But unfortunately, it is not just our research in discipline that is important. And now in the post-humanistic era, uh, we are very, very much, uh, we will be influenced by what other people think. Okay, so if students have a negative impression of University Malaya, that may, may not be too good. So right now, that's why communications is very, very important. The um, communication, international students' communication, we, we need to 
inform everybody how good we are. We already are very good. We already have a good team of lecturers here who are innovative and trying their best, but we don't highlight them. So ladies and gentlemen, we, we need to get you to publish as well to be innovative and, and, you know, highlight, win awards. So you have won awards. These awards also need to be, should be highlighted. Okay. And I don't know who we should, uh, we should ask whether ADAC has a, a hand in helping to highlight all these innovative uh, innovations that you do. I, I think we are starting in UM, but it's still a bit slow. So, we need yeah, supportive heads of departments, supportive deans and center heads to help us. Hmm? Yeah. Okay, so thank you, Prof. The nobility of the profession. Okay, so we, we must be wise. Yeah, and when we teach in a, in a way that engages with our students, that our students love, that is a, a very good point, okay? I don't know whether UM uh, being such a big corporation, corporation, whether we are slow in moving. So that, that could be one thing, uh, that if we are too slow, we might be overtaken by other universities. Okay, sad story. <laughs> Okay, so Clarissa, you also mentioned that um, you see that academics separate research from teaching and learning. The assumption is that if you teach a lot, you have less research burden. So it's not true, right? You know that it is not true. Eh? Okay, you might be teaching a lot as well as doing research. And uh, unfortunately, I think the younger lecturers tend to be bullied. Is it true? <laughs> I hope not. Okay. All right. Shall, shall I continue sharing? Um, so actually my purpose in sharing that particular uh, article was to show you how different types of data can be used. Okay. And that was sent to a, uh, it's a Scopus or emerging, in the emerging citations index, huh? Malaysian Journal of uh, Instruction learning and instruction. Okay, anyone would like to share their research or problems that they are having that you need maybe help in research methodology or if it's educational theory, I, I can try and have a look. Okay, is there any particular area you like to, you like yeah, to can ask? Can I go again? Um, yes, actually, Clarissa. Because mm -hmm. this is also... I mean, I have, yes, as I mentioned, I have published a, I mean, research on learning, but not specifically on education and definitely mm -hmm. not in a classroom setting. So this is my first time experimenting with that. Just how happens that I'm trying two things, one is an undergrad level and one is a grad level. So I start with the undergrad level. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do is actually to, for both grad and undergrad, is to improve students' writing skills, Right. Because I noticed that was a uh, real difficulty, regardless of whether they are master students or undergrad students. And these are humanities students, so I find it very concerned. Because writing is supposed to be one of their main skills. If they like that, then uh, employability will be difficult. And I'm also an employability, student employability coordinator, so I'm seeing this kind of stuff as well. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I wanted to use, because I, I teach drama, so I'm actually also teaching uh, under the SHE program for non-major first time so I'm excited but I'm also a bit scared because I don't really know how to do this yet because um, I never have in my teaching uh, experience so far I mean I have certain jobs where I teach teach a lot but some jobs where I hardly teach except maybe mm. grad students but they're always students who are specialists in an area not like general students not students coming to the class so and I'm actually trying to measure um I mean, for both classes, I also want to focus on writing and also learning uptake. So, and uh, one of the things I actually want to do is use action-based uh, assignment because like this semester, this coming semester, because of the pandemic again, so we are allowed to do alternative assessment. Otherwise, this class would be like 60% exams, which means I cannot try this thing out. 
So I want to use action based. Um, how do I say that? Uh, like say for the sixty percent that is supposed to exam based, I'm using action based assignment. So it's actually two different assignments, right? One actually is relating to fan fiction writing, and the other one is actually a uh, few work, right? Even though they're actually very different from each other, but they're all drawing on the content that they're actually learning in class. So it's actually different stages of content. And this is for students who are majors in drama. This is the first one I've designed. I'm still deciding how to adapt the same approach, but not exactly the same to the non-major students. So I'm, I'm not sure whether it's a wise idea on my part to try to attempt to craft a research around this while trying a brand new class at the same time. But maybe there's something to be learned from doing something like that. Um, so, and of course, I don't want to say that, oh, I'm doing a, a specific type of assignment. I rather call it action-based assignment because there are some variations in the assignment. So, and I'm trying to figure out, as I said, two classes, different sizes, different types of students. So how to craft, I think I have the problem statement, but how to craft a research design that works because this is the first time very I mean I've done research where we have participate participatory learning but it's very the research the all the participants know they are, they are, they are part of a research group and I mean they're in the they're part of a program that is research and they are not your uh, usual students actually they're much older adults and they are brought in for very specific purposes so they know exactly what they are getting out of that. Whereas in this case, right, I think there's also a part of exploratory approach because I'm also test bringing some of the ideas that I tried in different circumstances into the classroom and I don't know it might work or it might fail. And I, know, I also realized, as you also pointed out, that the type of students will also determine, right? Maybe one year we suddenly have like a lot of very good students, right? And then another year with a lot of the mm -hmm. very good students. So that can actually also influence the setting and also now I have to do with students who have background knowledge in that area that I'm teaching and another group of students who have probably I mean unless they're highly motivated who do self-learning probably zero to very minimal background knowledge so how am I actually going to measure the success of this method of mine right especially when because I cannot completely control the outcome I set the parameters of what and guidance of how they should produce the assignment control the outcome of the assignment so and they may have their own interpretation as well so like how I would deal with the data because I tend to use the student um, assignment outcome means yeah oh, this assignment they handed actually as part of my data for my examination of it. so that's actually where a lot of my data comes from so let's say during tutorial sessions or class discussion when I ask them about, about how their feelings and their um difficulties and what they really like about the assignment that also is part of the data that I'm collecting so it's not really interview maybe it's it's most like in focus group because it's a classroom setting I suppose uh, except that I'm not going to make it into like a really focus group thing because I really want students to feel free to be able to feedback right mm -hmm. so I don't want to impose too much of the very strict formalized research setting in this sense I actually want to capture things that come out naturally from the students themselves. So this is actually for the undergrad. It's a little bit more control as for very specific kind of assignments, right? And the other thing I want to do is actually for grad students, which is actually I'm in the process also of designing an academic writing course for graduate students in my faculty. And I thought well, this would be a great idea also to design research around it at the same time. Because the impetus for that was because I did an initial well initially my head said why don't we do something for our department but our department is actually very small so our graduate students small as well and then we obviously we even do a survey which is a small size of grad students you don't really know what is what are the needs so um, my head sent out the survey that I kind of designed to just mostly just assess what students felt they were lacking in, and they need in terms of academic writing and we sent it to all students from the entire faculty we got back a lot of responses and i realized it's no longer just hey running one or two workshops and teaching how to write academically that doesn't actually work probably will fail as much as them taking the english courses right now mm -hmm. so i am now trying to do sort of like a pre-course research on how to best design the best course and then do the course implementation cost implementation research 
when the course is being implemented and then research after the course. So there's like three stages to that. So I'm taking my time with this because I still, I've never done this before. I even tried to talk to a colleague uh, in the US who's actually a professor in writing. And he told me they haven't actually done anything as formal as this, not even in the US. Even in US where I have the special, they have a department of writing, but they have never done that because all the focus is on professional writing, creative writing, you know, other forms of writing, but not academic writing, right? We have like a writing centers. I know like in the US and even I think some, the Europe, not, at least from what I heard from my colleague, uh, UK might start, might have started doing this, but the US is front and center in having like, you know, writing centers to assist students in terms of, of writing. I was actually a tutor in one of such centers in when I was doing my PhD. So I have like first-hand knowledge of how it actually runs. But they don't specifically teach academic writing so much as they teach writing, which I think is a good thing because I think we don't even have that in UM and most universities in Malaysia, actually. Um, so, they, so they have that kind of focus, teaching students how to communicate through writing at a disciplinary level, which is something I'm interested in. But I realize, uh, especially when I'm dealing with grad students, it's not just that. These are uh, writing courses geared at undergrad students who may or may not become academics. But how do you deal with grad students, some of whom have higher aspirations and also want to be academics? And we talk about getting students to publish, but the thing is they don't even know how to start writing. Right, let alone getting published. So, how do we help them? Right. So, I'm trying to do a research on this specific cost development, which I hope will also feed back into the cost improvement. On top of course, getting it published and getting it out there, seeing that there's a gap of knowledge in that, seeing that even in more developed worlds, they don't even really have that yet. There's very little research. There's a lot of research done on student learning, how to help students master difficult texts, blah, 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 stuff like that, but not a lot on academic writing. And when I see books on academic writing, it's about teaching advanced grad students how to get published. I say, okay, that means you already crossed the hurdle of knowing how to write well academically. But how do you deal with that in-between group, right? Students who are not quite there yet, but who are supposed to be more advanced than undergrads in terms of their writing skills. So yeah, so I'm trying to design a research around the cost development itself. So if you have any guidance on this, and if you know anyone who has done something similar, it would be great to connect with such a person so I can also um, learn from that and also exchange ideas on how do you do something like this or is this maybe a little bit over-ambitious? But yeah. So yeah, the second one, which is a huge project and the smaller one, which is more self <laughs> Okay. While you were talking, Clarissa, I took notes. Huh? So... <laughs> So let me respond to you. Okay, luckily I took notes because it was quite a lot, right? <laughs> okay, but um, thank you for asking and, and sharing. And I think I can I think I can help you in some ways. Lah, okay, Let, let's see whether what I how my response is, whether it's in, it helps you or not. Number one, the writing skills. You want to improve the writing skills, um, okay, in your action-based environment, huh? Uh, action-based assignment. I think this one is very much like action research. This looks to me very much like action research. And perhaps you should you should report it like action research rather than using a very quantitative, very controlled-like experimental um, groups, you know, uh, you, you, that means don't compare because they are two very different classes of two different types of, <laughs> you have so many variables and all this is where all the extraneous variables comes in. So you, if you attempt to compare them, uh, it's going to be, so now I understand, okay, your, your, your difficulty. So don't compare them as if you are doing an experimental research. Instead, if you just, Use if you use an action based research, it might be more acceptable. Yeah. Uh, action research, not action based research. I'm influenced by your <laughs> this one. So use it as an action research and uh, tell us that this is a unique case where you are starting. So the uniqueness, so I put that context, uh, that is actually uh, the where they put context. That is actually the strength of your particular research. Uh, this one here, okay, uh, because you have a very specific 
context right now, students who are not from drama or do not have uh, experience in the discipline coming in. So that particular context is very relevant. And yes, put it as an exploratory. So that's where action research comes in. Okay, and assignment is data. Yes, all right. Uh, so what you intend to do the in, uh, is a, you call it a focus group. But actually, in a focus group, you are supposed to make the students uh, relax and, and, you know, talk to you casually. So it is definitely going to be informal. It is still a focus group, but data collection is in a very naturalistic, so that's qualitative environment. Okay, so I see good potential uh, as a very different kind of action research, not the normal Okay, action research where you have two different groups of two different capabilities. So yes, why not? I think uh, so. Don't don't make it a quantitative, experimental, and you know with distinct comp uh, comparisons. No, okay. But instead, it is going to be very much qualitative, and probably when you get you know your data out, you can see emerging. From the data, maybe something new, something interesting. It will give us, so to me, I think that the implication is uh, for future, for other researchers and other uh, instructors who are doing, who are going to be teaching in, um, you know, students who are not from their background. Okay, teaching something new, teaching what non-discipline? <laughs> Is it such a, such a thing as non-discipline <laughs> student not in discipline? One of the yeah. things. Uh, that no, what? Uh, the one of the main things I would love to compare with between students who are in the discipline and outside the discipline because I'm teaching hmm. two different. Yeah, yeah. Two different courses in terms of title, but the content well. Of course, the content has to be a bit different because one is for students with background and one is students with no background, right? Mm. Mm. That, and I think, yes, I like your idea of action research because there's no way I can compare experimentally. Mm. Mm. Yes. There is students which is completely possible. The fact that they're already from different disciplines in one group, right? Probably 10 or 20 disciplines and then one that's all one discipline is already a major uh, difference mm. in itself. And, it, and it's a very good difference, actually, because rarely would you get such a situation, right? So, yeah, take advantage of it and, <laughs> and yeah, get some writing from it, okay? At least we, we can learn. We can learn, you see, from you. Because I know the she courses, huh, we are all, uh, uh, I'm also having one with IT and also worrying, you know, how or what is going to happen, but. Yeah, so it's mm, so you, actually you spur me also. Maybe I should do something with my group also. <laughs> but yes, this is something very useful that we can learn and will help definitely people in UM. We would like to know about it, and it would also be useful out of University of Malaya in Malaysia, maybe even in other countries. Okay, so I think there's quite good potential for for publication here. Okay, don't make it experimental. That's right, that one cannot. But um, action research that you, you want to inform practice. Okay, because this is a problem that needs to be solved. <laughs> okay, your second, your second um, issue or second problem or second research has great potential, but I think it cannot be solved immediately. Okay, uh, it needs a longer period of time. So your academic writing course, it sounds like a program to me. So that's why I put the highlight. So I think you will be developing a program and I'm going to suggest, uh, I'm going to suggest that you do a MOOC. Is it possible? <laughs> I have to talk to my faculty because at this point, my <laughs> wants to contain it within, within their faculty. I guess they're a bit proprietary. Oh, okay. <laughs> And now KPI I, or MOOC. Uh. <laughs> I, I start from that. As you say, it's potential to develop beyond a single faculty to a lot of other faculties. But I'm starting at, initially it's supposed to be departmental, but then it got spread to the faculty uh. level. I haven't even done that 
program yet. So I am. I, I thought it would be a good chance to also uh, start, you know, recording my process of developing this from the pre-course to the course development to the implementation to every, every stage. Because in most part, we only focus in one area. But since this is completely new, it would be great to have. I mean, I guess you can even you can end up publishing mm. 10 over many years or <laughs> just to stay alone. So... So yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to chart everything from before, mm-hmm. like what got the idea uh, moving to begin with, and what are all the research that goes behind the development and then the actual development itself and the challenges of such development because you have to figure out how we implement it within the UM ecosystem, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. which will be another headache. How do you implement it? And how do you sustain it? And how can it be useful? I also want to chart that to chart mm-hmm. the, because I think. I mean, be, beyond it being just uh, be research papers, I suppose you can even create um, policy recommendation out of mm. this whole thing. Mm. Well, I'm interested to know if the other researchers are doing this. I mean, I'm not a specialist in academic writing, right? I can use my own experience in academic writing and what I learned as, as a student from my mentors and also from attending writing workshops. But... I'm not even a specialist in writing to begin with, right? Not, not like compared to my colleague who's actually a professor in writing. So how uh, would I even do something like this? It's almost very, impossible. Oh, but very good idea. You, you are correct. So you may not be a specialist in writing, but you have the experts, right? You have the experts. You have the literature. So this is actually, that's why I put this diagram here, design and developmental research. When you develop the program, you are designing something new. You get from literature, you get from experts um, overseas, okay, who don't know the situation, and you get from people who know the, you said the in-between group, right? People are not the people in the in-between group, but people who know the in-between group. Um, So you get them to give you input on what needs to be in a design phase. If you're doing design and developmental research, I mentioned uh, FDM, Fuzzy Delphi Method. I have also used with my students, um, a PhD student, uh, ACTA, where this is a cognitive task analysis. So you get your experts. So it's basically... Maybe this is the easiest, uh, interviewing your experts to get input on what is important in the design of the module. In your case, you're actually doing a module. So um, they would suggest certain things should be put in. And then, uh, so it's a task analysis in the sense that, okay, this one, if you do this, what do you need to do? So getting or analyzing what needs to be in the module with experts from overseas, from Malaysia, who, who know the exact situation that you're in from UM, lah, that means, okay? And, and also looking at literature. So that's actually the design phase can be a paper. If you don't want a paper, it's okay. <laughs> you can, this is, this is also part of the uh, curriculum development process. MQA, <laughs> ask us to always get expert input, right? So actually the, the um, MQA, the MQF framework is all based on instructional design, which is also this DDR framework. And then the evaluation. So we don't need to wait for five years also. You can, you can evaluate the module or the suggested module with experts. We need to actually validate the module before implementation, getting experts, not necessary as many experts here, but at least uh, some to evaluate the, the module before implementation. And then you want to collect data. So you don't need to collect after five years. Yeah. Okay. You can get straight away from your experts who are reviewing your module. Okay. But if you do a MOOC, uh, the only thing is maybe the, the effort and the work uh, involved. <laughs> the, the MOOC can be open to everybody in the world. And you may find, uh, actually, there are a lot of people from developing countries, from Africa, Nigeria, you know, just 
even Southeast Asia who may actually have students who want or are very interested in this module. So, Clarissa, MOOC. <laughs> and UM will be interested to make uh, money. Yes, department charge of MOOC development in UM because I'm not sure which department does that. Edek. Uh, we go, you go through ADEC. ADEC has a set of forms that you need to fill in and they have instructional designers. I think Sharifa is also an instructional designer okay, who will help you uh, develop the MOOC. But first the idea and then after the idea, uh, then they'll work together with you. So you work with ADEC. Okay. Let me think about how to do this thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. First, first, you think about the program as you collect data. Okay, that that will be experts in the design of the program. Okay. Fantastic. Okay, very good. <laughs> it's also it's kind of like similar. I just want to run it through you because one of these before I even design this thing, I want to do start with something that is less ambitious. For instance, maybe try out a very, very, very mini version of that, like in a specific uh, master's pro uh, course that I'm teaching. Because I know students in the master's course are struggling with writing, right? So I want to test it out with them. And of course, mm -hmm. every, because I teach this specific course every single semester, so technically I could use, um, I, I only became really aware of this uh, fairly recently because, I, because some group of students seem to have less problem than, as I say, another group of students because of their difference right mm. so I decided mm -hmm. first time uh, in my second year in UM that I'm actually going to test this out at the sort of like a mini level and it's because mm. this is in a way uh, motivated by this development of this other academic writing uh, program mm. so so yeah so would, could that actually be considered a pre program research in a way or is that mm, okay? So you call it a needs analysis, <laughs> an, an analysis of the needs of the students who will be attending the program. Yeah, but it's a very small group of students, and they are not even going to be the direct beneficiary of this specific program, which is targeted more at a uh, research level students. Uh, not sure whether it's even get you know do it with students who are not the direct direct beneficiaries. Yeah, so you, you could uh, put that, I mean, it is a needs analysis. If you look at the MQA uh, framework or MQF framework, they, they want us to do this kind of thing. So the potential, yeah, they may not be the direct recipients of the program, but potentially what they would think that also will help us okay. to gauge. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sorry to hop the line. <laughs> okay, Clarissa, but I'm sure everybody learned from your experience, right? Huh? Okay, so um, uh, one link, okay, acceptable to use data from previous cohort as a control group to be compared. You have to um, mention, in some cases, yes, you, you have no choice but to use the previous cohort. Um, so it's not really a control, but yeah, uh, it's not a real control in the sense that you don't do it together, but yes, you can. So you can report the previous semester without the intervention, uh, what was the results like, okay? And then the new semester, which you uh, implemented this. So you have to try and see how different the cohort is because every cohort may be different. Eh? Group of students, they have different capacities sometimes. So you have to try and um, it's okay. So in, in this kind of humanistic kind of research, it's okay to, to show that you have limitations uh, as long as you recognize that this is a limitation. So it is not a real control. You can report that each cohort is different. So we recognize the limitation. However, there are still things that we can learn from this comparison. So that is something that we can we can do. Okay, so thanks one link for the question. Okay, anyone else has mentioned anything? Prof Siti has already left. Huh? <laughs> yeah, he also 
made a, a lot of uh, philosophical comments. Mm. Okay. All right. Is there anyone else who would like to share? We have maybe one more person if you like to. Or should I call your names? <laughs> Actually, we, we should, we have the participants. Eh? So we have our participants ready, our students. Uh, we have limitations, yes, like sometimes number of students or different cohorts of students. Um, but we should try and and design a research that will fit in with the different students. And I'm making a, a prediction that I think SOTEL scholarship of teaching and learning will be becoming more and more important. Okay, it'll be more important soon. This is uh, something that has, has started a long time ago. Okay, and it is still a field that is getting more and more important, and especially now that we are chasing for university rankings, okay, it will be important to advertise our lecturers and show how good they are in innovative teaching and learning. Technology sometimes helps. Technology helps a lot in, in getting published, meaning that if you use new technologies, uh, so, Clarissa, when you're doing your, your research, huh, try and think of a way to document your, uh, your, students, your students' work. Okay? So, your action-based assignment, get them to do things that are technology-based, right? either infographics, videos, the video development. I'm sure you do things like that right? for your area. Okay? Capture the data, get them to lock in their opinions, on instead of just doing everything on focus group interview when you discuss with your class, get them to also maybe put in a discussion forum on that topic and see what they write. Or maybe collect data from reflections. Uh, this is another thing that students' reflections. Yeah, I have all this actually from a previous uh, iteration of the course that I've done. Uh -huh. and I differently based on what I learned from the mistakes from the previous course. Uh -huh. and what motivated me to think that maybe I should turn this into an actual proper research project rather than formally, you know, mm. learning, not really uh, documenting it properly. So that's that's what I want to do. But I guess this also is back to the ethics question, right? I guess retrospectively, you can refer to older data, right? I mean, as long as... Mm. I mean, if I'm referring to somewhere specific student assignment, I may ask the students for permission because... They may be using it for their portfolio and all that. Um, yes. I guess you can just ask for permission. You don't have to go through the whole review board thing. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so good luck. Huh? So we'll, we'll see you publishing soon. Huh? <laughs> okay. All right. Um, yeah. So use technology, be innovative. Be innovative. That's what they're looking for. Huh? They're looking for things that are different for publication. Okay, anyone else wants to share? Nope. If not, I guess you had a long three hours. <laughs> if there is no other comments. Uh, maybe Dr. Dorothy, I want to say something. I'm Pan from uh, Copy of Pharmacy. I think yeah, thank I you for motivating us because I had a manuscript written uh, two years ago, it was actually an edit grant. I was very, how to say, I was very positive about the the, the, the work actually, but it was it, it, it was actually it, it it got rejected so many times. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, even not not going through peer review, and sometimes they want the plagiarism index, similarly mm. index to be less than five percent. <laughs> so mm. maybe it's actually the journal that I targeted is wrong. Mm. So basically, the study was actually comparing the medical students 
I'll, I split them into two groups. One treatment group is actually asking them to try another methods of studying histology. So usually we study using microscope, light microscope. So now we convert everything into digitalized microscopy. So I compare those two. Then I also have pre-test and post-test according to different system in the body. So we have nervous system, lymphatic system, and then we do pre and post test. And then when I look at the, the, the manuscript that you shared, I think you're very kind to share with us your manuscript. And you, I think you devoted a whole paragraph on the theories and also the educational theories. I think that is what I'm lacking. I'm reporting mm. it as though it is like a 100% um, science paper. So I think I'm lacking on that. Mm. And also maybe my title is wrong or something like that. So, <laughs> and, and then uh, I think after today, I will try to pick up the paper again. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. So actually you mentioned uh, one thing very correct. It is the theories that actually underline or underpin the research. It is that interdisciplinary nature, which is uh, sometimes very difficult to find. So getting the, like in your case, maybe the education educational theory to match with the theory that you are using for your research. Okay, so, um, but can, can be matched because there's so many different types of educational theory. I'm sure you'll be able to find it, but uh, maybe you may need an education person to help you. So, yeah. Pan, you, you know me well, so you can run by me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I also noticed that uh, I think throughout the point that you were saying something like sometimes we do the experiment first and then we start off like try to find our way and path and then we start to match with the education. So yes. it is it, it's totally different from my field, you see. Yes, so we always I start know. with a problem statement, we want to solve the problem, but education is something like, you know, we go with the flow first, <laughs> we match with the education theory. That uh, is only qualitative, right? That is only qualitative. qualitative. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. So I understand it more clearly now. I think, uh, um, yeah, I think I still have faith with that particular study. Yeah, mm. so I think that now that now that the university is acknowledging Scopus paper, I think no harm to send it to Scopus. <laughs> yeah. Okay, okay, all right. I mean, we need to show to the university that, you know, here, look at us. We, we do have some lecturers who are innovative and want to try mm. new things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, all the best. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen here also, if, if you have anything, any other questions you think about, uh, you can email me. I'm at dorothy at um.edu.my. Tell me that you attended this, um, this workshop, then at least I, I'll pay more attention lah, compared to somebody who I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so... Okay, so I... I I will um, try and see uh, how I can help you. If I cannot help you, um, like Clarissa mentioned, okay, if you still need some more help, Clarissa, tell me, I can maybe direct you to people who may be, you know, ex may have expertise in that particular field. Okay, so, okay, all the best. Yeah, Shirley, okay. <laughs> all having headaches with all the research that you're going to do, right? Oh. <laughs> Shirley is going to look at supervisory techniques huh? <laughs> yeah. okay so ladies and gentlemen uh, I think Sharifa it's okay right to finish off now yeah mm -hmm. sure <laughs> okay because uh, later on uh, and, and actually <laughs> feedback to ADAC you can tell ADAC whether you need more of such research <laughs> <laughs> more of uh, what else do you need actually the light tech um, conferences are very good you know but maybe like you say pan not enough support uh, to publish what do you need because the light tech conference uh, proceedings alone is different so proceedings is one thing winning an award also is one thing but to publish a paper is another thing a, a different kind of depth and yeah so maybe ADAC I think in, this is the first step in having a, a session like this. Uh, you begin to strategize and you begin to realize what you need and what you have to look for. Okay. So all the best, everybody. Oh, yeah. You want to take photo uh, since I see Pan's face so clearly. That's the point. Get you ready.
Um, I thank you, Dr. Dorothy. Um, How about Cla- Clarissa also open your your app camera. Yeah. I can see you. <laughs> Also, uh, don't forget to fill in the feedback form and attendance form. Uh, you need to fill in both the forms for both the forms must. We, we couldn't. We missed you uh, for a while. I think both the forms have to be filled out to get your certificate. Uh. Yeah, correct. Well, Doctor Nas in the kereta. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. okay, so it's Do just need, the four. Do you need to take a photo, everybody? Yeah. 